Well, kia ora, good morning to all of you and welcome to those watching it online. It's wonderful to be with you this morning. Someone just said to me, uh, Tim, it's far easier preaching when the All Blacks win. I think that's very true. So this is going to be much easier than it could have been. Hey, we are in the story of Joseph and we are in Genesis chapter 41 today. And I want to um, kick off looking at Genesis 41 by looking at some words that a very famous young New Zealand theologian once uttered in the movie, The Hunt for the Wilder People. And here is the guy, his name is Ricky Baker. You'll recognise him if you saw the movie. Let me tell you very briefly the story of The Hunt for the Wilder People. It's an iconic Kiwi movie, 2016 it came out. And the story is really, this kid Ricky Baker is a foster child, goes to live with a foster parents, the mum dies, the foster dad is, is played by Sam Neill. And Sam Neill doesn't really like poor old Ricky Baker, but they go on a big adventure for the rest of the movie. And at the end of the movie, uh, the authorities are coming looking for Ricky to try and bring him back into foster care because he's gone AWOL. And, uh, and the, the last, one of the last scenes is um, set in the um, desert road in the middle of the North Island. And there he is in the car, and he's about to go crazy with Sam Neill as everyone is chasing him. You've got the, the tanks, you've got the police, you've got the helicopters. They're all going through the desert, trying to, uh, the desert road, trying to catch Ricky Baker. And Ricky Baker utters these famous words as he comes to um, really going for it. He says, I didn't choose this life. This life chose me. And that's the theological question I want to base Genesis 41 around today. Let me put it in slightly more nuanced terms than how Ricky describes it. Do our individual choices matter or is everything preset anyway? And I want to use Genesis 41 as the basis to answer that question because Joseph, um, it's a transitional chapter for Joseph. He starts in a prison cell. He ends up prime minister of Egypt. And so it's a significant change in Joseph's fortunes, chapter 41. And it seems to us that Joseph at times is choosing his own life, and then at other times, some other force is choosing Joseph's life for him. So I want to look at that question, and I want to bring three truths to us today to apply to us in 2023. I want to look at the paradox involved in this chapter, the purpose, the presence, and then a couple of applications at the end. So let me give you the summary of where we have got to before we hit the start of Genesis 41. Joseph is a young 17-year-old. He um, ends up telling his brothers about a dream he's had. They're all going to bow down to him. And then he wears this amazing coat that's very famous. And his brothers, through jealousy, throw him into a pit. He gets bought by some Midianites. They end up selling him to Potiphar. Pot of his wife fancies Joseph. Joseph does the right thing, but still gets thrown into jail. There's two people in jail, a cupbearer and a baker. He interprets their dreams. The cupbearer gets out and lives. The baker gets out and has his head chopped off. And then we hit verse 1 of chapter 41, when two full years had passed. And I want you to see the paradox going on in Joseph's life as we answer this question, is it, is it um, me who chooses my life or is my life predetermined for me? I want you to see the paradox as we look at Joseph. Because at times for Joseph, it seems he does choose. And then at other times, it seems like someone is choosing for him. So when Joseph is 17, the, the, the author of Genesis tells us he has this dream and he goes to his brother's. And he tells it to the brothers, and Genesis 37, 5 says, they hated him even more. So here's this spoiled brat who's been raised by his mum and dad because he is the favourite. And he can't wait to tell his brothers about his dream. And it gets worse than what Joseph is doing because then we move on and we see that he has this fancy coat. And he can't wait to go to his brothers and show him this richly ornamented robe that he is wearing. And the brothers take Joseph and throw him into a pit. And you could say, well, sirs, you're right, Joe. I mean, you were lording it over your brothers. You made them jealous. You played a part in what happened in your life at that moment. So we can see at times what happens to Joseph, he gets what's coming. But then the rest of the story up to chapter 41, it seems to go the opposite way. 
I mean, with Potiphar's wife, he does the right thing and he still ends up in jail. With uh, the cupbearer and the baker, he is promised that he will get out of jail because he's interpreted the dream, but he's still stuck in prison at the start of chapter 41. Here's the paradox. Sometimes Joseph chooses his life, and yet sometimes life seems to choose him. So the question is, who's running his life? And the question for us, if we bring it to us today, is who runs our lives? Is it me or is it God? Now, we answer that in different ways. We might say, well, it's 50% me and it's 50% God, or it's 80% me, 20% God, or the other way around. We are either or people in our society, how we answer that question. Ricky Baker is 100%, it's predetermined, I have nothing to do with it. But the Bible teaches something different. The Bible says it's not either or, it's both and. It's 100% me and it's 100% God. And I want to give you an illustration of what that looks like. Uh, Joseph's father, Jacob, is exhibit A, if you like, of how it is all him and yet it is all God working through him. Because here is Jacob and he um, deceives his father and he makes his brother Esau angry. And so because of his choices, he has to get away from where he is. He never sees his mother again. And so Jacob, but he, through ending up meeting people, he ends up having children and through the line of his children, the Messiah comes. So we look at Jacob's life and we say, well, he made some bad choices, but somehow God brought the Messiah through those bad choices. Did Jacob choose right what he did? No, and he paid the penalty for that. But despite 100% being what he chose to do, God also worked 100% in his life. Jacob is a model of the biblical 100%, 100%. Now let's look at Joseph as another example of that. Because here is a summary, if you like, of chapter 41. In chapter 41, um, Pharaoh has a dream. And no one in the whole Egyptian kingdom can interpret the dream. The cupbearer finally wakes up and realizes there's a guy in jail that is good at interpreting dreams. He brings Joseph out of jail, goes to Pharaoh. He tells Pharaoh the dream is effectively first a feast and then a famine in Egypt. Pharaoh makes him prime minister of Egypt and they collect all the um, grain from the feast and they store it up ready for the famine. That's chapter 41. But at the end of chapter 41, there's a, a significant verse and it goes like this. When the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout Egypt. And all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere. What a contrast that is. He starts the chapter forgotten. No one in the world is aware of Joseph. We get to the end of the chapter and the writer, the narrator, wants us to see the whole world comes to Joseph. And so right there, we see 100% Joseph and we see 100% God, just like his father Jacob before him. Joseph made some bad decisions. He paid for those bad decisions. But God worked through Joseph eventually to get to the end of this chapter. And eventually we'll see that even Israel comes to Egypt, the, the, the Hebrew people. And God saves even the Hebrew people through Joseph as he relieves the famine for those people. Joseph gets it. I think Joseph sees the paradox because at the end of chapter 50, when he meets his brothers, this is nine chapters on from where we are today, he says something fascinating to his brothers. He says, you, talking to his brothers, intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Joseph had screwed up his life, but somehow God had worked through that to preserve the nation of Israel. And Paul, writing thousands of years later to the church in Rome, wrote effectively the New Testament equivalent of what you see on your screen here. He wrote in Romans 8.28, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now let me anticipate an objection as I've got that on the screen, because I've preached on this before. 
and I talk, I've talked about this before, and people have come to me and said, um, I don't like that concept. I want to be totally in control of my life. I don't want God or anyone else, for that matter, playing a part in how my life ends up. I want to be in charge. I want to answer that with an illustration and then land the plane for you. Uh, here's the illustration. Um, a few years ago now, I was doing a harvest swim in Auckland, and I trained for this harvest swim in the pool, and the swim was from Rangitoto Island to Mission Bay. Those of you who know Auckland, it's about 4, 4.7 kilometres. You would all this training for months ready for this big ocean swim. They take you out uh, in the boat, uh, and then you jump in the water at Rangitoto, and the gun goes, and you can see Mission Bay somewhere in the distance there, and, and you just swim. Sounds simple, doesn't it, when you just put it like that? Someone uh, who was very wise said to me, Tim, um, it's going to be like a washing machine when you first start. So you've got three, 400 people all behind this line, and it's just going to be carnage for the first little bit. So put in about 20 or 30 big strokes, and that will get you away from trouble, and then you'll be fine and you won't get kicked or hit by a stray hand or whatever. So I thought, well, that makes a lot of sense. So the gun goes, we're all heading towards Mission Bay. I put in my 20 or 30 big strokes. Finally, I realise there's no one around me, and I think, well, this is fantastic. This really works. So I looked up. I was actually swimming back to Rangitoto. I had somehow, see, I only worked out at that moment, there's no black line on the bottom of the sea. And I'd done a 180 degrees turn without even knowing it, and I was closer to the beach at Rangitoto than I was when I started. There was no wonder there was no one else around me. They'd all decided to swim straight. Radical idea. I tell you that illustration because I think in life sometimes we think the right way to go, we're heading towards Mission Bay. But in reality, we're in trouble and we're heading towards Rangitoto. And we don't even know it till we actually look up and realise. And that is why I would answer the objection, I want to be totally in control of my life. If you really think about this truth, you wouldn't get out of bed in the morning if you thought you really were in total control of your life. Because I look at myself at 25, and I'm glad that God did not give me everything I asked for when I was 25. I'm now 59. I suspect if I get to 70 or 80, I'm going to look back to the 59-year-old Tim and be thankful even now that God doesn't give me everything I ask for. It is tremendously reassuring to know and so practical to know that it's 100% us, but it's also 100% God working in our lives. Here's what that does. Here's why it is so practical. It's practical because it stops us being passive. It's practical because it makes us realize that what we do actually matters. But it gives us a tremendous peace as we go through our lives, knowing at the end of the day, as Christians, we can't stuff up our lives. And God will work through our choices, good and bad, to still bring plan A into fruition at the end of it all. And that's what Joseph realized. And that's partly what this chapter 41 is about. So I want to move on to purpose now because I want to look at why, I want to ask the question really, why was Joseph in a prison cell for two years? I mean, could God have achieved what we just talked about getting to the end of the chapter? Could he have achieved it simply by allowing him to be in prison for two weeks? Or what about going and living in suburbia, downtown Cairo for a little while until the whole Pharaoh dream starts? But for some reason, God has Joseph stuck in a prison cell for another two years. And I want to broaden that question to us today and use this prison cell analogy to talk about any circumstances in our lives that we wish we, were not, we, wish we weren't in at, in this present day. It might be trouble with our health. It might be trouble with our money or our relationships or our job. But many of us from time to time are stuck in prison cells and we don't know why we're there and we'd rather not be there. And I want to look at the purpose of why Joseph was in that prison cell and bring it into us here in 2023. And I want to give you a general reason and a specific reason. The general reason we're in our prison cells from time to time is to bring about good 
and a specific reason is to bring about holiness or growing in godliness. Let me show you bringing about good, the general reason that Joseph and us are sometimes in our prison cells. Let's go back to 50 verse 20. You intended it to harm me, but God intended it for good. And we also looked at Romans 8, 28. For God, um, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Notice not saying all things are good. Sometimes life just sucks. But what it is saying is even in the suckiness of life, God is still working for the good to bring about good from the bad experiences. And I think what this verse is saying and what Romans 8, 28 is saying is this. From the vantage point of heaven, from eternity, we will look back and understand how God has worked in our lives to bring about good. Even though we may never have a realisation that Joseph has in chapter 50, verse 20, that he had. We might never get that till we go and die and be with God. But the Bible teaches that to be true. Let me give you two biblical illustrations of that. Let me talk to you about Job for a minute. Job... If you ever try and read the book of Job, it's a hard read. I mean, it's a lot of chapters. And, you know, you start the book of Job and Satan comes to God and he says, that guy Job, uh, he's only in relationship with you because of what's in it for him. Let me give him a little bit of time in the prison cell, figuratively, and you will see he's not really in it for you. And God says, okay, he's all yours. And we go... Uh, God, could you just back this up? Could you just not allow Satan to work in Job's life like that? But he seems to let him, and Job survives. And then the next day, Satan comes to God again, and he does the same thing again with Job. And you get to the end of the book, and you better understand what is going on and why um, God is allowing Satan to do this to Job. But here's the amazing thing about the book of Job. Satan intended to harm him, just like you see on the screen. But that book of Job has turned out to help hundreds of millions of people be faithful to a loving God despite the prison cells that they are in. You intended it to harm me, Satan. God turned it around 180 degrees and brought it around for good. And then there's the story of Jesus himself. If you look at Jesus, in effect, uh, when he was going around Palestine, uh, there was, I've read some commentary that says there was no illness in Palestine for those last few months. He was healing people. He was feeding, feeding the people who are hungry. He was healing the sick. And he goes to the cross. And you look at Jesus going to the cross. And all those people looking there would say, I don't see how anything good can come from this moment in history. Here is Jesus doing good, ends up on the cross. It looks like the evil intent of the authorities and Satan is going to win. And yet we look at the cross today and we understand that the results of the cross was the greatest thing that ever happened in human history. It brought about resurrection. It brought about eternal life for all believers. You intended it to harm me. God meant it for good, even at the cross. That's the general reason that sometimes we're in prison cells. Let me give you a specific reason as well. I think also we end up in our prison cells to grow in godliness. And it's really interesting in the story of Joseph in this chapter 41, that Pharaoh has this dream, Joseph interprets it for him, and then here is verse 36 that um, that Pharaoh says. I think actually this is Joseph talking. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. And then Pharaoh talks to his officials and I love what he says in verse 38. He looks at Joseph and he says this. Pharaoh asked them, the officials, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the spirit of God? Now friends, that's a remarkable verse because if you're Pharaoh... Your job description is deity. You are a god if you're Pharaoh. You have all the resources, all the money. You mix with all the movers and shakers. You're educated, you're wise. If you've seen impressive people in your life, Pharaoh would have seen them. And he looks at this Hebrew slave who's come out of prison cell and he says, I see in this man the spirit of God. 
And what I think the narrator wants us to see, specifically sometimes why we are in our prison cells, is that God uses this time to produce godliness in us. Trouble brings us closer to God. And we don't always want to be brought closer to God in the, and through trouble. We'd rather be brought closer to God without going through the prison cells. C.S. Lewis picked up on that in the way Lewis can, and he says this. What would really satisfy us would be a God who sort of, who said of anything we happen to like doing, what does it matter so long as they are contented? We want, in fact, not so much a father in heaven as a grandfather in heaven, a senile benevolence who, as they say, like to see young people enjoying themselves and whose plan for the universe was simply that it might truly be said at the end of the day, a good time was had by all. Sometimes we want a senile, benevolent, loving grandfather, and God says, I won't be that for you. The thing you most need is for me to be working through your trouble, through your pain, to bring you closer to me and to be more like me. And that is the general reason and the specific reason of why we go through prison cells in our lives. Third take home from this wonderful chapter is presence. And it's amazing to think, I mean, here is Joseph. And he, you get to the end of a story in, in chapter 41. And he writes, he, he, I mean, you couldn't get anyone more ingrained officially in Egyptian culture, a culture when you get to the end of chapter 41. Pharaoh has put a signet ring on him. He's got a cloak on him. He's changed his name. He's married an Egyptian woman. He's riding around in Egyptian chariots. But he has these two children. And what he writes in verse 51, which I'll show you in a minute, is a call back to his relationship with his covenant God, Yahweh. Because look what he writes in, in the verse 50, 51 and 52. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, it is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Friends, that's covenantal language right there. Here is Joseph who has not been assimilated into Egyptian culture when it comes to his relationship with his Yahweh God. And I bet every time he looks at those two boys as they grow up, he remembers the presence of God in his life, even through the prison cells. And I think that we are meant to see also that God is present with us, even through our prison, our prison cells. So, let me give us two applications to close this message today. The first one is for people who may be seeking who are involved in this church. One of the things of a large church like this, um, where the people come on a Sunday or watch us online, is that there are people always checking out Christianity. And we want you to know you are so welcome. And one of the reasons we do what we do is to provide you a safe environment to come in and look at Christianity and have your questions answered. And what's really fascinating in the story is that I want to show you the other bit player in the story is Pharaoh and how he shows the two key attributes seekers need to make spiritual progress in their lives. Two key attributes. Number one, I'll show you in a minute, Pharaoh comes to the end of his own self-sufficiency. Second, Pharaoh realizes that this world has nothing to offer him because we all ask the questions of life. How did I get here? Where do I go when I die? Uh, what, what is my purpose in life? How do I keep the love relationships that I desperately want to keep? And the world has no answers to those big questions of life. And Pharaoh, interestingly enough, I'm not saying he became a believer, but we will get a, a surprise one day in heaven when we see people we didn't think were there and we will see people there uh, that, we, that are there and we'll be surprised some people aren't there. But look at Pharaoh, look what he's doing uh, as he's interacting with Joseph. First of all, he has this dream and here's the first requirement of a seeker to make spiritual progress. It says, in the morning, his mind was troubled. So he has come to the end of a self-sufficiency. He doesn't have the answers to the problem that he has, and he realizes that. And then second, secondly, he realizes the world has nothing to offer because look at verse 14. 
He says, so Pharaoh sent for Joseph and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. Fascinating. He's got all the resources of Egypt at his hands. That's the world that he knows and it cannot help him when it comes to interpreting his dream. And he calls on a Hebrew slave with no money, no power, no connection. And he says, I need your help because this world has nothing to offer me. I want to say to your friend, if you're a seeker, if you're interested in finding out about Christianity, I'd encourage you to consider the way to make spiritual progress is first of all to realize to come to the end of your self-sufficiency and secondly, to realize that ultimately to the big questions of life, this world has nothing to offer you. And can I say this? I didn't say this in the first service, but I'll add it now. I can understand when you're seeking that you might not believe Christianity is true. I believe it's true. This is a separate sermon that I think I could show you why Christianity is true. But I can't understand why you wouldn't want it to be true. I mean, what we've talked about today is utterly remarkable. As Christians, you are in total control of your life, 100%, but you have the loving arms of a heavenly father who loves you to bits, who will make sure ultimately you can't stuff up your life. Why wouldn't you want that? And I ask that question to make you consider seeking further the truth of Christianity. Second and last um, application is forming or formation. This, this whole series is called uh, a, a transformed life, a formed life. And I think Joseph points, interestingly enough, to what it looks like to have a transformed life. But I want to pick up just one aspect of what I think Joseph has been doing in the prison cell over those two years. He would have had a lot of time on his own, and I think he would have been meditating. Eastern meditation, forget everything that you can. Christian meditation, remember everything that you can. And Joseph would have been remembering his Yahweh, his presence with Yahweh, let me define meditation because if we can do this, this is how we get transformed. Meditation drives the word of God from our heads to our hearts by prayer until it catches fire in our souls. It's a great definition. And so let me show you what that looks like just briefly because Joseph points to something that happened 1,700 years later. And Paul writes about that when he writes to the church at Philippi and he talks about Jesus coming down and making himself nothing. And this is what Paul writes in Philippians 2.7. He, let's look at it word by word, he, God, who holds together the universe in his pinky, made himself. It was voluntarily. It wasn't the, the nails that kept Jesus to the cross. It was him voluntarily going to the cross. He made himself nothing. The triune God comes down and makes himself even below a slave. Why? So that you and I, who are outside a relationship with him, can be brought back into relationship with the God of heaven. If you like, the story of Joseph is a story about a nobody who becomes a somebody. And he points 1,700 years later to a Somebody, to a somebody who in Philippians 2 7 became a nobody, so that we today, who otherwise would be nobodies, no relationship with Jesus, can become somebodies again. When you look at that, when you meditate on it, when you go through it word by word, that will melt you to the core and change you from the inside out. And that is the key to a formed life. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. God works for the good of all those who love him. Ricky Baker, he's an either or sort of guy. Our God is a both and sort of God. Let's rejoice in that truth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this tremendous chapter. We thank you that there are times we're in our prison cells and we just don't want to be there. But even in those tough times, you are still working for good and you are still producing godliness in us. We thank you for the tremendous truth 
that though we are 100% responsible for our lives and that drives us from being passive and makes us look to make wise decisions, that despite that, you are 100% working through your plan in us. Plan A, not plan B. And that gives us tremendous peace. We rejoice in that truth today. Thank you for these words from Genesis 41. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.